time is not come. In progress. The time that the Lord's house should be built. Now you remember what we left? Pause in Ezra. That stage where the people were had abandoned the work of the temple. So that's exactly the context that Haggai is addressing. Verse 2. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sold much, and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. Ye drink, but are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none water. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages, to put it into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains, and bring wood, and build a house house of God, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. You looked for much, and lo, it came to little, and when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is waste. You run every man to his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I call for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labour of the land. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet. As the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, in the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts their God. In the twenty-fourth day of the sixth month, in the second year of Darius, the king. So there were just over three weeks between the beginning of the chapter and the end of the chapter. The beginning of the chapter is the first day of the sixth month. And then we find ourselves at the 24th day um, of the, the, well, that's the seventh month, sorry. So there's just a, a little over um, five or six weeks, isn't it? Well, can we read now? Um, no, sorry, I'm confusing you. I, my eye fell on verse on chapter two there, and I looked at the seventh month. No, I was right in what I said. It is the twenty fourth day of the sixth month. So that, um, yeah, I knew that didn't sound right. Um, so there was there was just over three weeks between the beginning and the end of the chapter. I'll come back to all of that later on. But can we read just now as well in the next book, the book of the prophet Zechariah? And chapter one again. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius. So, in other words, this is uh, two months after Haggai chapter one, we have Zechariah chapter one. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord to Zechariah, the son of Berchiah, the son of Edo, the prophet, saying, The Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers. Therefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, 
and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord. He not as your father, to whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn you now from your evil ways and your evil doings, but they did not hear, not hearken unto me, saith the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophet, did they not take hold of your fathers? And they returned and said, Like as the Lord thought to do unto us, according to our ways and according to our doings, so hath he dealt with us. Upon the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month Shabbat, in the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, the prophet, saying, I saw by night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse, and he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom, and behind him there were red horses, speckled and white. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord hath sent to walk to and fro through the earth. And they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth. And behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah, against which thou hast an indignation these threescore and ten or seventy years? And the Lord answered the angel that talked with me with good words and comfortable words. For the angel that communed with me said to me, Cry, say, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. And so on, trust the Lord to follow with this blessing or reading of his word. Now we sing now from God's word from Psalm 33. We're going to sing 6 to 11. Stephen, we turn now again, well, not again tonight, but again in our studies to the Old Testament and to the book of the prophet Ezra. The book of Ezra. And we paused just before the holidays at the end of chapter 4. That was a good place to pause, actually, because things are about to change in this next section. It will be helpful if it would be the last verse of chapter 4. It sets the whole thing in its historical context. So Ezra, we're going to read again verse 24 of chapter 4, but my interest tonight is just in the first two verses of chapter 5, which we'll also read. Ezra 4, 24, Then ceased the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. So it ceased unto the second year of the reign of Darius, King of Persia. Now you'll remember that it's exactly the date that we saw in our reading in Haggai and our reading in Zechariah. The second year, the reign of Darius, King of Persia. Verse 1 and 5 there. Then the prophets, Haggai the prophet, and Zechariah the son of Edo, prophesied to the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. Then he rose up, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, and began to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. And with them were the prophets of God helping them. Well, as I said a moment ago, last month we paused at the end of chapter 4. Here in chapter 5, it picks up the narrative 
And I'm not going to spend any time on the production this evening. I want to come straight to the passage. And there are two things that I want to focus on tonight. I want us to look, first of all, at the discouraging background to these verses. And then secondly, and in more detail, the encouraging message of these verses. So we have the discouraging background and the encouraging message. But we begin with the discouraging background to ver these verses that we just read. And there's, there's two aspects to that background. First of all, there is inevitably, of course, a historical background. We're reminded here, again, that the Bible is, it's a historical document. It's full of historical references. And, and when you hear people who, who, who say, well, Bible's not, you know, it's not rooted in history and all the rest of it, you wonder if they've ever read the Bible. The Bible is full of historical references. Again and again and again, things are dated. Sometimes very precisely. In the case of Haggai, you can even tell which day of the month the time. Now that is extraordinary, considering the vast length of time that has gone by. And it is interesting, not that we base our faith on the basis of archaeology, we don't we believe the word of God, eh, what our archaeology may say. But it is interesting, the more they dig, the more they look, the more they research, the more they discover that these dates and these references fit exactly into the very place they were meant to fit. And this is an assurance to us about how confident we can be in the word of God. So there's a historical background, but the historical background was a bit discouraging. Things were very unstable politically at that time. And this was a big discouragement for the Jews. The remnant have come back, as we've seen, to Jerusalem, and they've got the task of rebuilding the temple and eventually rebuilding their lives and society. And the sheer political uncertainty that was around didn't help one little bit. There were dark clouds on the horizon. You know, it's not always the case. There are dark clouds on the horizon at the moment. And you hear people talking about these things. And you'd think that this was the first time you got in the mystery of mankind that there were issues and problems. But the Bible tells us there have been issues and problems since man first fell. That's the root cause. And until we face up to that, our efforts will be sorely uh, lacking in success. So in those days as well, there were dark clouds on the horizon. As we move from Ezra chapter 4 to Ezra chapter 5, we move on about 14 years. There's about a 14-year gap between these two chapters. And in these 14 years, certain things had happened. And suddenly, as far as the political and international situation was concerned, Cyrus, um, we, we're moving... Um, Start that sentence again. We're moving in chapter four from the reign of Cyrus, the emperor, who did so much to help the Jews, and we've seen that in the previous chapters, to the reign in chapter five of this man, Darius. Cyrus was killed in battle in the year 530 BC. He was succeeded by his brother who was a very different character. The three died after a short reign in somewhat mysterious circumstances. The next emperor was Darius. And if you remember the book of Daniel, you remember the feet of there as well. Now Darius reigned for about 40 years. But this is at the beginning of his way. Things were uncertain and unclear exactly how these power struggles were going to take place. 
But we're taking up the story, as it says in, in the last verse of chapter 4, in the second year of the reign of Darius, the king of Persia. Persia, of course, is uh, what we now know as Iran, it's that part of the world, and that was the center of the empire. The instability of that age led the Jews, amongst other things, to become fearful and despondent. And you know, the Christian church can become despondent and uncertain by things that are going on around us. We think of very frightened, uncertain age, don't we? Terrified, people are terrified, especially young people. It's really sad to see, actually. Uh, because they're no they have no stubborn. They don't know where they've come from. They don't know what's going to happen. The world might end at any moment. They have no concept of a God who is sovereign and in control. And it's a travesty, of course, that that is absent from their understanding. Because once that is in your understanding, you know that things will be different. Huh? Right. Nothing will happen, but nothing will happen but according to his will and purpose. And there's always a danger that the Christian becomes infected by the fear and the despondency of the age. And that can become mass hysteria, you know, uh, in the world of fear. It can become hysteria. The Christian church is to maintain calm, and the Christian believer is to maintain a calm outlook on these things. We don't know what will happen. We don't know exactly how things will work out. And there may be greater difficulties than there are at the moment. There may be less. The Lord brings. We must continue to not. He's building his church. He's guarding his people. He is slowly bringing down the force of darkness. The details will leave to him. So that's part of the historical background. Those whole things have been discouraging. Furthermore, Darius was a he was a very religious man. That was a good religion. He was a Zoroastrian. He was a Zoroastrian. And he made that the official religion of Persia. And that led many to our concerns as well. Would this lead to an outlawing of other religions? Would this lead to a clamping down and all the rest of it? And again, we can relate to that. We see that around us as, as the new religion of the age, which is an aggressive secularism, it has its own creed. It has its own officials, and dearly, it has its own heresy and its own heresy comes. And again, that creates uncertainty. And if we didn't believe that the Lord reigned, and that the Lord hadn't seen many certain religious grouping rise and fall, we would become very despondent. So that's a historical background. It's a bit discouraging. But then we have a spiritual background, and it's very discouraging. It's very discouraging. You remember back to the end of chapter 4, we saw that sadly, because of discouragement and the sheer campaign of harassment which went on, the work of building the temple halted. And for over a decade, not a single bit of progress was made. And the people didn't become idle. They just shifted their priorities. And we saw in Haggai chapter 1 that they began to build their own houses. And Haggai tells us that they put a lot of effort into that. He has his own comment on, on these houses and how grand they were. But he said the house of the work of the temple, not an inch of progress. Their spiritual concerns. Their spiritual priorities had been replaced by temporal interests. They had a new focus. And the new focus was themselves and getting on with their own things. And slowly, slowly, the concerns of God and of his house melted into the background. They became discouraged and they abandoned the work. So here we are at the beginning of chapter 5. What 14, no, 16 years probably 
after the euphoria and the joy of these opening chapters. You remember in chapters 1 and 2 how delighted they were and the joy of building the work and it was going on at great speed. Here we are some 16 years later and the work is nowhere near completion. They haven't made the progress they should have and spiritual lethargy and decline has set in. What well, is the discouraging background for these verses? But separately, what about the encouraging message of these verses? Well, what happens? Well, what happens is this. The Lord steps in. And in verse 1 and 2, we're told that the Lord is able to turn things around and lift things up. And that, in a nutshell, is the encouragement. The Lord is able to come even when things are at a low end and turn them around and lift them up. And how does the Lord do it? He did it by his word. He sends preachers to declare his word and that preaching was blessed by the Lord. What an encouragement that is. When you look at society, when you look at the needs of the church, you know, it looks, it looks impossible. <laughs> it is impossible. It's just us that's doing it, of course. But we are reminded here of the power the Lord can exact in our Lord. What the Lord was able to do today, He is able to repeat in our day too. Well, we look at verse 1 and we see the names of the preachers. We're not surprised. We read already in Haggai 1 and Zechariah 1 about their preaching at this time. Then the prophets Haggai and Zechariah prophesied, now prophesied there, and it, 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 it doesn't mean that they were foretelling the future. That was a part of the prophetic office. They were preachers as well. They were preaching the word of God. That's what they were doing in Jerusalem. Two well-known Old Testament prophets. What does it tell us? What lessons can we take away? What can I suggest? Why? First of all, God's word is the answer. God's word is the answer. What's the answer when the church is in lethargy? What's the answer when the church is in decline? What's the answer when you wander away from where you should be? What's the answer when your priorities have become all wrong? What's word is the answer? Back to the word of God. That's where you'll find reviving of soul. That's where you'll find what will do up and redirect. Back to the word. You see, when God wants to do a work, he does it through his word. And when he wants to do a work in a society, he sends preachers. There we are in Acts 2. And, and the disciples are there. And what are they among so many? What does the Lord do? He sends preachers. He sends Peter. Peter preaches. And in an amazing turn, 3,000 are converted in one day. At 16, there's a heathen Philippi. The Lord wants to do a work in Philippi. What does he send? He sends his word. Paul comes, preaches the word. This person, that person, the next person is converted. Before you know it, there's a church in Philippi. You want to see men and women converted? You want to see them built up in the faith? You want to see the church advance? In the preaching of the word. Blessing of God's word, the reading of God's word, the distribution of God's word is fundamental. By the foolishness of preaching, that is the means that God has provided. And you know that verse, um, times ago. you know that verse in Romans 10, where it, it's, how shall they heal without a preacher, and how shall they preach except they be sent, and so on. You don't have to invent new meaning. 
The Lord didn't have to invent some new means to stir things up in Jerusalem. He used what was already there. And he still doesn't have to invent new means. It's always already there. And when the sword of the Spirit accompanies the word, things happen. My friend, be encouraged. Be encouraged. That's the first lesson. God's word is the answer. Similarly, God's word is authoritative. Verse 1. Then they came and they prophesied to the Jews in the name of the God of Israel. Oh, the opposition looks too big. But what is, what is the opposition in comparison to the name and the power of the God of Israel? Isn't that what we see in Acts chapter 2 for us? And we need to pray for this, that God's word would be authoritative and powerful, that it would uh, reach out to us. That it would reach up to us and that it would reach out from us into a needy word. God's word is the answer. God's word is authoritative. Thirdly, God's word is uncomfortable. Now, the two prophets who I mentioned here, they're very different types of men. We read in Haggai chapter 1 about the ministry of this man. His ministry was very direct. Haggai was one of these ministers that, that would have you squirming in the pew. He comes on the scene and he says, what's happened to the house of God? Or they had their excuses first. Or they said, it's not the right time. What he says, I'm seeing it's, it's the right time for other things to go on. Can you explain that one to me? He exhorts them to give careful thought to their way. Think carefully, work, work faithfully. It was all very uncomfortable, but it was exactly what they needed to hear. In Zechariah, on the other hand, we read part of chapter 1. Very different sort of man, very different sort of ministry. Lord uses different types of ministry and different types of preaching of the word. It's not related to one or one type, not at all. But the heart of the book of Zechariah was, was vision. You saw that. We saw the first of these visions, the horses and so on. You read through these visions and you'll discover they are, they are also uncomfortable. I'll tell you something else about Zechariah. Time and time again, he directs us back to the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, that's what we need in the preaching of the word. That's what you need in your own life. The more you go back to Christ, the more you will be encouraged. The more you focus on Christ, the more you will be equipped to follow him and to walk with him. Derek Thomas says this about Zechariah. At the heart of Zechariah's message is a focus on the coming Redeemer. And he points out that Jesus himself reflected deeply on the passages, some of the passages in Zechariah. Zechariah is attempting to get the Lord's people to catch a glimpse of the greater plan and purpose for which the temple was but a sign. Why bother with the temple? Why not leave it in ruins? The temple was important because it pointed to Jesus. I was going to read more, but my time is not going too quickly, but you can ponder on it yourselves. This is the message that God blesses. A message that is Christ focused, and the more your focus is there, the better things will be. So God's word is the answer. God's word is authoritative. God's word is uncomfortable. Fourthly, God's word is a kindness. The Lord doesn't leave them in dejection. Years go by. He doesn't leave them wallowing in self-pity. He doesn't allow the work that he started to grind to a halt. He steps in. How fond he is. How patient he is. I was ready to give a new start. He is again and again. Swiftly, God's word is effective. We see this in verse 2. We see it in Haggai as well. 
they come, they preach, and the work we do. The preaching of God's word produces effects, produces acts of repentance and renewal of the word of God. Has it not often been like? The Lord wanted to bring a change to Europe. He raises up Martin Luther, a preacher, and a string of preachers in his way. The Lord wanted to do a work in our own nation. He raised up preacher. The Lord wanted to do a work right here, in this very spot, more or less, in which we're standing. What did he do? He sent preacher. And into the darkness of this island and of the highlands came the sweeping power of God that turned a church sunk in deadness and superstition and, and folly to a, to, a, to a ridiculous extent. And the land was transformed. Often we should not lose faith in God, in his power, in his grace, and in his mind. Never underestimate the power of the preaching of God's word. Every advance, somebody said, from Abraham to the book of Acts began with the word of God. Abraham hears God's word, not preached, but communicated to him, talking before scripture was, was complete. The word of the Lord came to him, the word of the Lord stirs him up, and the word of the Lord won't stop until he keeps where he was and he moves in, into the land of promise. The word of the Lord in the life of Jacob, the word of the Lord in the life of Joseph. I could go through the whole testament, the word of God, again and again and again. Oh, do not lose your confidence. Do not lose your study of it. All you are in it, better equipped you are. The true prophet is the one whose words come down from heaven to the earth, searching the heart, reaching the conscience, exposing the evil. What we need to hear Haggai and Zechariah too. easy to become disillusioned. It's easy to become worthy. It's a great temptation to the Christian church. It's a great danger. Remember the story of Sinbad. One of the events in the story of Sinbad, he's, he's in, I think it's probably the Indian Ocean, on a ship. And this magnetic rock rises out of the sea. And it, what does it do? It slowly draws the nails and the bolts and everything else out of the ship. One by one, they're drawn from the ship's side and the whole thing falls apart and the sailors find themselves in the sea. That's the way the word is. It's the way Satan is. It slowly draws us in. Magnetizes. Well, the great antidote to it is the word of God. Then rose up Zerubbabel and Joshua began to build the house of God, which is the Jerusalem, with them were the prophets of God. Helping them. Hey. When you challenge in verse 3, but that will have to wait until we arrive to the we praise thy name, O Lord, for this word, this word of God that speaks to us. We pray that it would speak to us evermore, that we would be challenged by it, led by it, fed by it, directed by it. Bless, Lord, the preaching of the word to our congregation, to our loved ones, to our kith and kin. Grant, Lord, that they would hear and that uh, they would hear as the people heard Haggai and Zechariah and that they would be stirred up and touched. Haggai and Zechariah are gone. They are mere men. The Lord is the same. Oh, may the sword of the Spirit cut and wound and heal as in our old car. Forgive us for our unbelief. Forgive us for our sloth, our failure to realize and remember the power and the authority of God's Word. Help us to remember and to show in our own lives that God's word is the answer. 
that God's word is authoritative. And even if God's word is uncomfortable, help us, O oh Lord, to see that it is nevertheless effective. Hear us and cleanse us from sin. For Jesus' sake, amen. <laughs> Back to Psalm 119 and we're at verse 97. Again, verses speak of God's word. We're going to sing from 97 to the end of this section. Oh, how love I, my Lord. <laughs> oh, how love I, my Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion and fellowship of God the Holy Spirit. Let us dawn and abide with you all, love and forever. Amen. Amen.